Hello, hello, how are y'all today? We got two on Zoom. Let's wait and see if anybody else is going to be here. Alexis, do you know if Avery's coming today? No, ma'am, I don't know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I can see <clears> though. <throat> oh, it's fine. I just wasn't sure if you knew. All righty. We will go ahead and get started. So we are um, all right. So we're going to go ahead and check our homework. Let me share my screen real quick, and we'll go through and look at what we had. So we had worked with um, our conversions. And I think our first part of our homework was pages 87 and 88, I think. So we'll go ahead and open up there first to check homework. So let's see, that is with... <clears throat> Lesson 40, because we had already done all those other ones. So lesson 40. Pages 87 and 88. Alrighty, so let's just done that. And uh, okay. Maybe get it at that eighty seven and eighty eight. Oh, and then I have the face. Perfect. Let's see if it's working with you. There it is. <laughs> Workbooks. I have it. Okay. Um. Need to finish these. That's fine. Just take that one page. I'll get it. That's fine. You can just bring it up on Thursday. Say the list together, and you can bring you that one. All right. So um, we said we're on pages eighty-seven and eighty-eight. 
Let's go check these from our conversions. Oh, get y'all, get y'all, get y'all. Am I getting your homework done? Okay. I'll tell you what. What we will do is, um, real quick, we'll go over these. I still want y'all to do the conversions because it's going to be something that you need to work on if you don't know how to do it, especially when you get to chemistry. It's going to be rough. All right. So 16 inches is equal to... Whoop, Forty point six four centimeters. Eleven inches is equal to two hundred and seventy nine point four millimeters. Nine yards is equal to eight hundred and nineteen meters. Fourteen miles is equal to twenty two point five four kilometers. Twenty five centimeters is equal to nine point seven five inches. Seven meters is equal to seven point six three yards. 12 kilometers is equal to 7.44 miles. And the next column for the next section on page 88, nine miles is equal to 15,840 yards. Seven miles is equal to 36,960 feet. 10 yards is equal to 360 inches. 69 feet is equal to 23 yards. 11 yards is equal to 33 feet. 21,120 feet is equal to four miles. 15,840 yards is equal to nine miles. 13 feet is equal to 156 inches. 108 inches is equal to nine feet. 396 inches is equal to 11 yards, okay? Um, and then our next section of homework. Any questions on those? Did anybody need me to go over any of those? Okay, so the first part was pages 87 and 83, activities two and three, and then we had page 129. We had some more percent problems to work on page 129. All right, so the first was on 129, this goes along with lesson, was that 59? Yes, ma'am. All righty. Okay, so in lesson 59, let me bring up my participants just in case Avery tries to log in. <clears throat> All right, so lesson 59, we had this right hand column. And we're dealing with our percents and we said what per, what is 238 percent of 500 and so we find that 238 percent of 500 is 1190 remember we talked about how when i have a percent that is larger than 100 percent, i know my part is going to be larger than my whole number so 1190 what is 234.9 percent of 200 that will be 469.8. What is 1,042% of 300? That will be 3,126. And then what is 1,554% of 600? And that is 9,324. Any questions on any of those? And I believe that was it. All righty, so let's see, 59. All right, 
right, so now we are going to start on page 131. We're kind of shifting gears a little bit. We're shifting away from dealing with percents and things like that. And we are going to start working with, oh, I guess I've got to go through it. Let me see. We're going to start working with different forms of, um, um, rep data representation. Okay. So when we collect data in different kind of uh, research studies or just a just a basic um, question and answer kind of situation, we can organize data different ways. We can look at it as just straight numbers, but that's kind of boring sometimes and it's not real easy to see. And so we can use charts and graphs and things like that to help us to visually represent what the data is showing us so we can look at it and see very quickly what the numbers mean instead of having to really look at the numbers and compare is this number larger than this one or is it smaller than this one or how do they um how do they compare and so let me pull up really quick let's see what i did that in All right. <clears throat> Basically with our data's charts and graphs, um, we can see how on page 131, we're dealing with a pictograph, okay? And so a pictograph, sometimes referred to as a pictogram, uh, we spelled two different ways with, with just a, a one M at the end or an MME. And it just uses that graph. A pictograph will always have a title to tell which picture or symbol represents. So in the yellow box, it says to use the following pictograph to answer questions below. Title of this pictograph here. Um, lost Alexis. Here she comes. Back a little. So what is the title of our pictogram in this page? We're on page 131 in the box. One paper and Denny's store. So we can see that we are looking types of copy paper. And so we can see that there's 20 pounds, 24 pounds, 28 pounds, 67 pounds, and 80 pounds. And then we have our key below us what each of those little pictures mean. And so we can see the ones that look like stack pictures or stack that says that is equal to 10 reams of paper. And then a single picture is one ream of paper. Do you guys know what a ream is? A ream is actually, have you ever bought paper at the store? And it's in, it's, in, in a, it's just a pack of paper. For whatever reason, they call it a ream. So whether it's like a 500 page ream, 
coffee room I've ever been in there and had to get. So like usually we buy it by the box and there's probably, I don't know, over six, 10 reams in a box. Okay, so that's what it's talking about when it talks about a ream of paper, it's just that pack. So we can see with our 20 pound paper, how many figures do we have? Um, how many things do we see for our 10 pack? How many of our pictures represent 10 packs? Pack? How many do we have? Okay, so notice we've got one, two, three, four, five, that represents 10, right? So when I'm looking at that, five times 10 is what? 50. Okay, so we know that there's 50, and then there's, bless you, one, two, three of our individuals. So when I look at what number is actually represented here, that would be right, because we said that each of our circled ones are 10, and the other ones are individuals. Let's look at 24 pounds. How many 10 ream pictures do I have? Look at your 24 pound chart. How many do we have showing 10 reams? Three. Three, one, two, three. So how many is that? What's three times 10? Yeah. 30. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six individuals. So what number is represented on that chart? 36. 36, good. Let's look at, oh. 28 pounds. How many of the pictures do I have representing 10? Four. One, two, three, four. So what does that actually represent? 40. 40. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven individuals. So we have 47. What about the 67 pound? How many? Two. two. So that's 20. One, two, three. So there's 23. And how many of the 80 pound? One and two individuals. So what's our total number there? 12. 12. Good. So we can look and see how many packs of each type of paper he has. Okay. So by looking at this, what pound could we say is the most popular? We could look at it and say, hey, the, probably the 20 pound is the most popular because he keeps that in stock more. Which one would you say he probably doesn't sell much of? 80. The 80 pound, yeah, because that's going to be a pretty heavyweight paper. I don't know exactly what weight 80 pounds is. I don't know if it would be like the weight of your cardboard on your front of your cover of your book, um, but we would know that's a pretty heavy pound paper. When we're dealing with paper, the heavier the pound, the thicker the paper. So that's what that means. So we can see that probably he sells more of the 20 pound paper than he does of any of the others and he sells less of the 80 pound paper. All right, so let's go ahead and look at classwork. It says use the following pictograph to answer the questions below. These are rolls of bulletin board paper in Denny's store. Okay, so like um, thinking about a bulletin board um, typically is gonna be a display and then you can put paper um, on the background to, to fill it in. And so we've got red, yellow, blue, green, and orange, okay? We can look at the key below it. We see that our stack of circles represents four rolls. So each one picture equals four. And then we have our individual, okay? So how many rolls of red paper do we have? How many four. rolls of red paper? Four. We've got four stacks that represent four each, right? So what's four times four? 16. And then the one individual. So how many do we have? 17 of the red. What about the yellow? If each stack represents three, how much yellow paper do we have? We've got 12 of the four stacks. I mean, we've got, we've got three of the four stacks. That's gonna be 12 plus the two of the individuals. will be 14. Look at the blue. How many stacks do I have there, Noah? Two. Two, so how many does that represent? Eight. 
We've got eight plus the two individuals will be? 10. 10, good. All right, green. I've got one, two, three, four, five stacks of four. So how many is that? One, seven. I've got five stacks of four. What's five times four? Oh, no. That's okay. I'm on green. What's five times four? 20. 20 plus one. 21. And then orange. How many did you say, Olivia? One. All, All together is seven. Good. Whoop. No. Not that one. Wrong button. Yeah. So that would be seven. So it says, how many of each color does he have? We just wrote it right in that chart. So now it says, draw a pictograph to represent the following data. Denny sells hanging storage bags in his store. He sells the bags individually as well as in five bag packs. He currently has three extra small, seven small, 14 medium, nine large, and six extra large bags on hand. Draw a pictograph, including the title and the key. All right, so we're gonna draw a pictograph. So the first thing we've got to do is where we've got to look at what our title is gonna be. Okay, so what are we trying to draw a graph representing? Hanging bags and any store. Okay, so we've got hanging bags in Denny's store. Now, how many items are we having to compare here? We know we've got extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large. So how many things is that? One, two, three, four, five items. So when I draw my graph, I know I'm doing one, two, three, four, five. So we know we said we've got extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. All right, so we're comparing hanging bags, hanging storage bags. Okay, well, I don't have a clue what a hanging storage bag necessarily looks like, but what we've got to do is we've got to have a symbol. I think what I'll do is I'll just do my single will look like that. Um, this is on page 131. We're still on 131, activities two. Okay, so if I think that is equal to one bag, I'm gonna do, um, I'll look, make it look like it's stacked. That's gonna be my symbol for five bags. Or a five bag pack. Okay. So I'm showing mine where I've just got kind of a little boxy looking figure with a hook on top. Okay, so how many bags did we say there are of extra smalls? How many extra small bags do we have? Three. Three. Okay, so which symbol, am I gonna have to use my single or my five bag pack here? Am I gonna use my single or multiple um, picture? Your single. Single, and how many? Uh, three. We want it to represent three. Good, so I've got three hanging bags there. So I know that represents three. All right, I've got seven small using the least number of figures that I can use. How am I gonna draw that if I need to show seven? One five bag pack and two normal bags. 
Okay, one five bagpacks. So there's one, my little symbol for my multis. And then my single and a single. Good, so I have one multi and then two singles. What about for 14 medium bags? What do I need to represent 14? Two multiples. Two multiples. And, uh, four. and then four singles, good. So there's my multiples, two multiples, and then one, two, three, four singles. How about large? One multiple. One multiple. So I've got a total of nine. So how many does each of my multiple represent? What did we say our key was? Five. So if we have one multiple that's representing five and we need a total of nine, we've got five. Now we need one, four. two, three, four singles. Good. And then our last one, extra large, six extra large bags. So how many multiples do we need? One. One multiple and one single. Good. So basically the main thing to look at is when you look at a pictogram, you first wanna look at your title to see what is it talking about. Then you want to look at your key to see, okay, well, what does each little picture represent? What does it tell me? And I'll tell y'all that these are things that, um, they're very, you know, very simple in nature. A lot of times we're gonna see these pictographs maybe we can see them in science books. Sometimes we may see them in history books to represent information. And so the charts and diagrams that we're gonna be seeing, and they're gonna be things that you see even as you get older into older classes. I know one of the things that um, I've been working with my daughter on, she's a junior in high school and she's taken the ACT this weekend. And she took it previously in October. And one of the areas that she needed to work on was reading charts and graphs for the science testing. So it's the kind of thing where, you know, learning these graphs, the sooner you learn them, the better it's going to be because you are going to be seeing these things later on in school as well. Yes, pictographs. Huh? Can I show you what I did for my pictograph? Sure. <coughs> awesome. Okay, so you did you did your your multi bag. Okay, good job. Very good. So yeah, the main thing is, is when you set up your key, you're just showing what represents what. So look at yours, make sure you have your title, make sure you have your key. So if somebody were to look at it, they could tell exactly what it is. All right, let's turn over to page 132 and let's do a little bit of review. Okay, on 132, we are going to start with activities four. Activities for simplifying roots. All right, so think back to dealing with roots and radicals. If I've got the square root of 32 plus five times the square root of eight, first of all, what I've got to do is I look, I've got an addition problem, a subtraction problem, multiplication and division dealing with radicals. When I add or subtract radicals, what is my rule? What do I need to remember about adding and subtracting radicals? How are adding and subtracting radicals kind of like dealing with fractions? What do I have to have to add or subtract fractions? Common denominators. denominators. Good. So my denominators have to be the same to be able to add or subtract fractions. When I'm dealing with radicals, my radicals have to be the same, okay? And so I can look at this and I've got the square root of 32 plus five times the square root of eight. I don't have the same radicals here. So what I have to do since I'm not starting off with the same radicals is I've got to look and see, can I simplify to get the same radicals? So does anybody remember what our first step is to be able to simplify a radical? I'm gonna look at my number underneath that radical as the product of prime factors, okay? So prime factorization. So we're gonna start with the square root of 32 and we're gonna break it down. What is my smallest prime factor of 32? 
two, good, two. Two times what is 32? What is half of 32? Bless you. What I'll do is I'll kind of do my little ladder like we did. So we're doing 32. We said that would be two. Two will go into 32 16 times. What's my smallest prime factor of 16? Two, two and that's two times eight. Smallest prime factor of eight? Two, two and that's two times four. Smallest prime factor of four? Two. two, and that's two times one. And then I get down to where I just have my one in my denominator. So I can see that 32 is actually two times two times two times two times two. One, two, three, four, five twos. One, two, three, four, five. <clears throat> Plus five times. Now I'm going to break down the square root of eight. Eight is going to be two times two times two. Now, what do I need to do to my radicals once I've already listed my prime factors? What do I do with my radicals? I'll go ahead and turn the screen up. Sorry, turn the light out so y'all can see that screen a little bit better. What is the point in listing these as prime factors? I need to simplify it. What am I looking for here? Remember when I list them out, I'm looking for my buddies, right? How many buddies do I need to have of each number? How do I figure out how many buddies I need? What is my index? Remember my index is that little number that's right here? And if it's not there, I understand it to be what number? Two. A two, good, because I'm doing the square root. So if I don't have a number written there, I understand that to be a two. And that means I need two buddies. So I've got two twos and two twos and two twos, okay? So if I pull these two sets of two out, that means I've got two times two and what's left underneath my radical? A two, right? Because he didn't get buddied up. So I've got two times two times the square root of two. Each pair came out as a whole number two. And then my little guy that's left by himself has to stay. Here, I've got a set of twos that can come out. Now remember, I already had a five. So I'm gonna multiply that two by five. And then I've got that one guy left under the so now I have four times the square root of two plus five times the square root of two. Now my radicals are the same. They both have the square root of two. So when my radicals are the same, I add the numbers in front and I keep my radical. So I have nine times the square root of two, okay? This is something that we get pretty involved with in Algebra 1 as well. So learning this now is going to help you for next year. When I'm trying to simplify radicals, I have to break everything down into prime factors and simplify first. Then I look to see what can be combined. Let's look at two times the square root of 45 minus the square root of 80. I need to break down two times the square root of 45. Now, 45 is not even, so I know my smallest prime factor cannot be two. So what am I gonna try next? What is my next smallest prime factor after two? Three. Three. All right, three will go into 45 15 times. So now I need to break down 15. What's my smallest prime factor of 15? Three again, and that's three times five. Buddies or threes? I know those are going to be able to come out. And then do what? Then I've got minus the square root of 80. My smallest prime factor will be two. And it's going to be two times 40. My smallest prime factor of 40 will be two. And that's two times 20. Smallest prime factor of 20 is two. And that's two times 10. Smallest prime factor of 10 is two. And that's two times five. So again, I have buddy and a buddy, and this guy's gonna have to stay. So I started with a two, I multiply by the pair of three, or by three that I pulled out, and my five is under the radical, and I'm subtracting, 
I pulled out a two and a two, and the five has to stay under. So I have six times the square root of five minus four times the square root of five. My radicals are the same. So now I subtract six minus four, and that is gonna be two times the square root of five. I have to break it down, get the same radicals, and then I can either add or subtract. Now multiplying and dividing, totally different. I don't have to have the same radicals, but I do have to break everything down. So the first thing that I do when I multiply is I multiply my whole numbers. So six times two is 12. And then now this one, I have the cubed root. So what I'm gonna do is under the cube, um, under my radical, I'm gonna put 54 times 24. I'm just gonna write it out. But now I'm gonna go ahead and break it down into prime factors because I'm gonna need to simplify. So I have 12 times the cubed root of, all right, we've got to break down 54. 54 will be two times 27. 27 will be three times nine and nine is three times three. So two times three times three times three represents 54. Now I need to break down 24. 24, smallest prime factor is two and that's two times 12. 12 will be two times six and six will be two times three. So now notice that we've put 54 times 24, we have put that all under the radical sign, but we put it all as a product of prime factors. We broke down each one individually. So now look at what is my index here? What index do I have outside my radical? What number is that? A three. So that means I have to have groups of three this time. Earlier, our radical was understood to be a two. Now, because it is marked as a three, I know I have to have three buddies. So I've got one, two, three, threes, one, two, three, twos. So I can pull a group of threes out and a group of twos. I already had a 12, so I can't forget it. So I'm gonna multiply that by the three I pull out and by the two I pull out, okay? What is still left under the radical that cannot be matched? I have a two and a three, right? So underneath my radical, I have two times three. I don't have three of either of those, so they can't come out. So now I'm gonna multiply two times three times two. I'm sorry, 12 times three times two. What's 12 times three? Twelve times three. 36 and 36 times two. I'll be the same as 36 plus 36, 64. And under my radical, I have two times three is six. So my final answer is 64 times the square root of six. I multiplied my whole numbers outside first. And, huh? It needs to be the cubed root. Oh, thank you. I did. I forgot my index. Thank you. The cubed root of six. Yes. Any time that I have an index other than two that's understood, I have to make sure to write my index in my answer. All right. Now we have five times the cubed root of 48 divided by the cubed root of 250. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to rewrite this problem. And I'm going to write it as a fraction. because remember a fraction can represent a division problem. And so I'm able to see it better. So I don't have anything to divide my whole number five by. I just have a five, but I can simplify 48, the square, the cubed root of 48 over the cubed root of 250. What number will divide evenly into both of those? What's my smallest number that'll divide evenly into both of them? A two, right? Because they're both even numbers. What is 48 divided by two? 24. 24. What would 250 divided by two be? 125. So now I've got one, I've got 24 and 125. Um, is there anything that will divide evenly into either of those? Mm -mm, not that I can think of. So now I have 
five times the cubed root of 24 over the cubed root of 125. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break these down into prime factors. So I have five times the cubed root of, what is my smallest prime factor of 24? Two. two. And that would be two times 12. So now my smallest prime factor of 12 is two, two which is two times six. Smallest prime factor of six, two times three. All over. The cubed root of, now I've got to break down 125. What's my smallest prime factor of 125? It's not even, so it can't be two. How can I test it to see if it would be three? Remember when I do my divisibility test, I can add my digits together and one plus two is three and three plus five is eight. Is eight divided divisible by three? Mm -mm. So 125 isn't divisible by three. So what's my next prime factor after three? Five. five. So five will go into 125 how many times? 25 times. 25 times. And so what times what is 25? Five times five. Five times five. Okay. So remember, I have an index of three. So I've got three twos up here, three threes out here. So I've got my five that, whoops, go away. I had my five that I already had. I've got my group of twos that comes out. I've got my radical and the three that's left underneath it. Now what's gonna happen to my denominator? I just have that group of fives come out, right? So now I end up with 10 times the cubed root of three over five. But I can also simplify 10 and five now. What will divide evenly into both 10 and five? What are both 10 and five divisible by? Not two, not 10, five. Five divided by five is one, 10 divided by five is two. So I end up with an answer of two times the cubed root of three. And I don't even have to write that one in the denominator anymore, okay? So I just have to take it step by step. Look at my prime factors. Like I said, this is something that we will see again in Algebra 1 next year. So the sooner you get comfortable with the process, the easier it's going to be when you see it again. Always look to see what you can simplify by breaking down your prime factors, okay? Who remembers our simple, I'm sorry, no, this is compound interest. So we're going to jump over that. All right, let's look at activity six. Multiply or divide as indicated. Okay, so remember, what can I do before I multiply? Simplify. I can simplify. So I'm looking to see what numbers in my numerators will cancel with numbers in my denominators. So what is 42? Which of my numbers, 25 or 56, will 42 simplify with? Uh, 56. 56. What are they both divisible by? Seven. Hmm? Seven. Okay, seven. How many times will seven go into 42? Six times. Six times. How many times will it go into 56? Eight times. Eight times. What about 25 and 45? What are Eight. they both divisible by? You can simplify the six further. Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you say? You can simplify the eight and the six further. You can also simplify the six and the eight again. What are they both divisible by? Two. Two. Six divided by two is three. And eight divided by two is four. So now we've got them simplified pretty far down. What about 45 and 25? What are they both divisible by? Five? What's 45 divided by five? Close. Nine. Nine times five is 45. What's 25 divided by five? Five. So now I can see I've got three times nine is 27 over. Five times four is 20. So 27 over 20, and, so, and we can leave it as an improper fraction. Let's look at the next one. 27 over 42 times 49 over 63. What can I simplify between 27 and 63? Seven. Not seven. Or 
seven times nine. one is six, nine, good. And so 27 divided by nine is three, 63 divided by nine is seven. What about 49 and 42? We can divide those by seven, right? 49 divided by seven is seven. 42 divided by seven is six. What happens with this seven over seven? What are those divided? What do they simplify to? One. One over one. And what about three over six? Wait, wait. 49 over 63 is not one over one, if you think about it. Right? That's true. So we said we divided by seven. Seven times seven is 49. Oh, divided by seven, it should be a nine. My bad, I wrote the wrong thing. Let's fix that. Let me just erase. All right, it is break time here, so I'm gonna fix that and then we'll come back and pick up with this problem. So take a five minute break.
Patty. <clears throat> we'll get back to that problem. 27 over 42 times 49 over 63. We said the first thing we would do is we could reduce the 27 and the 63 by dividing both of them. Did I mess up again? We divided by nine, right? I did. Let's start this over. Okay. 27 divided by nine is three, correct? I'm trying to make sure I'm not losing my mind. 27 divided by nine is three. 63 divided by nine is seven, right? Okay. And then we were able to reduce 49 over seven. We could either do that and say 49 divided by seven is seven. 63 divided by seven is, I mean, seven divided by seven is one. That still looks like I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> I am too because what that, it, because it's not in a, we're, but I guess when we're canceling, we're canceling with other numbers as well. So we're not actually, um, actually, let's, let's go ahead and just do this. So we'll say um, 49 divided by seven is seven. 42 divided by seven is six, okay? 27 divided by nine is seven. No, it's not, it's three, good grief. 63 divided by seven is nine. But I didn't divide that by, hold up. Let me do this again. I, I, I don't know why I keep saying the wrong, writing the wrong thing. 27 divided by nine is three. 63 divided by nine is seven. Then seven divided by seven is one and three is one half. So notice that now we ended up with one half, okay? What if we had just multiplied 27 times 49? I'm just gonna do that on my calculator real quick. 27 times 49 is 1,323 over 42 times 63 is 2,646, okay? Notice that this is equal to one half. So it doesn't matter what it looks like in the problem. We're not actually canceling 49 and 63 saying it is one over one. It's because we are able to, uh, to uh, simplify with the numbers that are across or that are diagonal to it. So, Okay, even, sorry, I was just like. Yeah, I was gonna say, and that's what I kept looking at and going, no, that's not right because it, it didn't, you know, you're exactly right. 49 over 63 is not the same as seven over seven, but it was because we were cross, we were canceling with the numbers, the other numbers, that's what, that's what did it. All righty, now what do we know we need to do if we are multiplying mixed numbers? What do we do first? We want to change it to an improper fraction and then multiply. So what is a, a three and two elevenths? How would I change that to a mixed number? What is that going to be? 30, what? Five over 11. How did I get that? How did I get 35? 11 times three plus two. Good, 11 times three plus two, 11 times three is 33, 33 plus two is 35. So we have 35 over 11 times six and two sevenths, six times seven is 42, plus two is 44 over seven. So now I have 35 over 11 times 44 over seven. What can I do here? I can cancel 44 and 11, both are divisible by 11. So that's one and four. What about 35 and seven? What are they both divisible by? Seven, seven divided by seven is one, 35 divided by seven is five. We have five times four is 20, one times one is one, 20 divided by one is just 20. All right, 
And then we have four and four fifteenths times two and seven twenty fourths. Again, we're going to multiply 15 times four is going to be 60. 60 plus four is 64 over 15. Oop, not equals times. 24 times two is going to be 48 and 48 plus seven is going to be 55 over 24. All right. We know that um, eight times eight is 64. So that's divisible by eight and eight times three is 24. 55 is divisible by five and that's 11 and 15 is divisible by five and that's three. So I have 88 over nine, which I could convert. I could just leave it as a mixed number or I could change it to an improper fraction and that would be nine times nine, no. Nine times nine is 81, and we would have seven ninths, nine and seven ninths. All righty, let's move on to lesson 61, dealing with circle graphs. Go ahead and look at lesson 61. And it says circle graphs, also known as pie charts, are visual representations of the percent of each part of the whole, okay? We are comparing the percent of each part compared to the whole. So it says to draw a circle graph, first calculate the total value of the whole and the fraction of each part. Because there are 360 degrees in a circle, multiply each fraction by 360 de degrees to get the number of degrees for the sector or the piece of the pie. Use a protractor to measure the angle at the center of the circle Make a key to identify each sector and use the and give the chart a title, okay? So we're gonna do some estimations here. We're not actually gonna use protractors for this, but um, we just need to understand how they are used. So it says, Dwayne did a magic show at a magician's conference where some families from the public were invited to attend. Draw a pie chart to show the breakdown of the attendance at Dwayne's show. If there were 75 professional magicians, 25 amateur magicians, and 50 attendees from the public. So I know I've got to break it into three parts, okay? Now, we know that there were a total of 150. So in this situation, I know that 75 of the 150 were professionals. 25 of the 150 were amateurs and 50 of the 150 were from the public. So I have to set up my fraction first. And we know that to get each measure for each piece of pie, I have to multiply by 360 degrees. So 750 reduced is one half. And one half of 360 equals 180 degrees. 25 of 150 reduces, and 25 divided by 25 is 1, and 150 divided by 25 is 6, so I have 1 6. So again, when I multiply here, this is the same as multiplying fractions, and I would have 1 times 360 and 6 times 1. So basically that leaves 360 divided by 6, which is 60. So I know the other one has to be 60 degrees. Then 50 over 150, 50 divided by 50 is one, 150 divided by 50 is three, multiply by 360. So again, I would multiply one times 360 and three times one. So 360 divided by three is 120 degrees. Now, when I'm talking about my degrees here, a lot of times, um, especially what we'll see later on, my degrees deal with my angles, okay? so. This is an angle right here. This is an angle right here. And we can see this one is a different measure. Okay, so I have three different angle measurements here. Now, when I'm looking at each of these, which one of these is gonna represent 180 degrees? Which one of these is the larger section? When I look at my pie, when I look at the picture, which one represents 180 degrees? What color is it in your book? The blue one, professional. The blue one, yeah. So this one right here 
is going to represent my professional magicians. Okay. Which color represents my amateurs? Red. The red. And what color represents the public? Uh, green. Kind of a yellowy green, isn't it? I'll just make mine green. All right, so when I look at this, I don't even have to look at numbers. When I look at a circle graph, I can look at the size of the graph. So if I wanted to look at it really quick and see what was the largest part of my audience made up of? Who was the largest part of my audience? Professional magicians, right? Because that's the biggest piece of my pie. The smallest part of my audience were the amateur mag magicians, okay? So if I want to look at who, who were the most people at that show, all I have to do is look at what is the biggest part of my circle graph. And so that's what a circle graph does. It helps us to be able to identify parts of a group and compare them, okay? Um, what we're gonna do is we are going to skip over lessons 62 and 63 right now. And actually, let's go ahead and let's look at page 133. We're not going to make any pie charts right now. Probably on Thursday, I'll have some um, some practice with pie charts, but it'll be in a different form. I don't want you to have to actually worry about drawing them right now. Let's go ahead and jump over. Let's go ahead and look at page 136. What are these called? When I have fractions that are equal to each other, what do I call these? We could call them equivalent fractions if we knew what X was. It's a proportion. They're proportions, okay? So two equivalent fractions or two equivalent ratios are called proportions. Now, how do I solve for my unknown measure in a proportion? What do I need to do to solve for X here? Did I remember? When I have my equal sign between the two, that means I cross multiply, okay? So as long as there's that equal sign in the middle, I can cross multiply. What is 25 times X? 25 X equals 12 times 35. So 25 X is equal to, I'll just grab my calculator real quick. <clears throat> And 12 times 35 is equal to 420. Divide by 25, divide by 25, X is equal to, and so here I divide 420 by 25. <clears throat> Make sure I've got the page six here on. Circle graphs, right? Okay, actually, the way that they showed to do this, instead of multiplying that together, so we can see that these are not going to equal out. This is going to actually be a decimal. Okay, so it does say to leave as an improper fraction. So I know X is equal to 420 over 25. So now I'm going to simplify that and I'm over five. Okay, so just remember proportions, I cross multiply to solve. Okay. Like I said, we're going to skip over lesson 62. So what I want you to do is for homework, I want y'all to finish activity six. Okay, so activity six on page 136. So today is 12, seven. Okay, 
Okay, so page, um, let's say this is what, page 136, activity six. We're gonna skip over 62 and 63 for right now. And we are going to go to lesson 64, frequency distribution. Lesson 64, frequency distribution. So it says a frequency distribution table is a table listing the number of times each value appears in a set. To make a, fre a frequency distribution, first list each unique value from smallest to largest. Then list all inclusive values, including those values that do not appear in the set but are written within the range of the given values in the column. Next to each, place a tally mark for each time that value appears in the set. Finally, write a total number of times that the value appears in a column after the tally marks. So it says the number of people sitting in each row of the, set, of the center section at one of Dwayne's shows is as follows. 25, 24, 25, 23, 22, 24, 23, 24, 25, 25, 22, 20, 23, 22, and 24. Make a chart showing the frequency distribution of the seating at Dwayne's show. So we saw what is our smallest number that was listed there? Look at that list in the green box and what is my smallest number listed? I'm on page 141. 20. My smallest number listed is 20. What is my largest number listed? 25. So I know I've got a smallest and largest. So what they did is they said, okay, I'm gonna list all the numbers between 20 and 25. So they said 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. So they've made a chart saying, okay, this is the number of people. Then I have a, a column to tally, and then I have a column to give my final number. So how many times do I see 20 in that list? One time, so there was one tally. How many times do I see the number 21? Looking for 21 in that list up here. Is 21 listed at all? Mm -mm. So I have, I don't have any tally marks. How many times do I see the number 22? Good, I've got it one, two, three times. So there are three tally marks. How many times do I see the number 23? Three times again, one, two, three. So there are three tally marks. What about 24? Four times and 25, four. four times. So see how they just said, all right, now I can see how many had 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25, okay? So listing those tally marks just helps us to make a quick record. And then all I do is add my tally marks up at the end to show the number, okay? So let's go ahead and classwork one says to make a chart showing the frequency distribution of the results of the roll of a game die. Okay, so talking about basically a single die from a game. All right, so what is my smallest number listed? So on the die, how many, what's my smallest number? One, what's my largest number? Six. Six. So I know I'm gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now I've got to look, how many ones do I see? There's one, one, one. Okay, so I'm putting a tally mark each time I cross off a number, I put a tally. Let's look for twos. I've got two, and that's it. Going for three, 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 three. Now, when I get to a, a fifth three, I cross it off. And then my next three will start a one. So I group my tallies in groups of five. So I go one, two, three, four, and then my fifth one crosses over. 
So I can just look at that immediately and know that's five instead of having to count them. Now my number four, I've got one, two, three, four. The number five, one, two, three. And the number six, only have it twice. So then when I look, I can say, hey, that's three. There's one, that's six, four, three, two. Okay, so all you're doing is setting it up to say, this is my numbers, these are my tallies, and this is my actual number. So I can use that to show it, okay? So what we're gonna do is for homework, We are going to have um, activities two. Oh, uh, no, we're going to skip activities two because that's mean and median, and we haven't done that yet. Let's go ahead and look at activities three on page 142. This one says we need to draw a pictograph. When Dwayne does a two hour theater show, he usually does 10 grand illustrations. 10 small, I'm sorry, I said illustrations, illusions, 10 small illusions, and 10 silk tricks. When he does a banquet or award show, he usually does 12 small illusions and 10 silk tricks. Draw a pictograph showing the number of each type of trick Dwayne does at theaters and banquets, okay? So to draw a pictograph, you'll need to think about what is your key going to represent? What are you gonna to use to represent multiples? What are you gonna to use to represent singles? And so you will draw a pictograph as part of your homework. That's activities three on page 142, okay? <clears throat> we are gonna skip over a couple more pages. I'm gonna save mode and range for when we get back after Christmas, we're gonna start with mean, median, mode, and range. So now we're gonna go ahead and look at stem and leaf plots on page 67. So go ahead and jump over to page 147. Stem and leaf plots. All right, so it says a stem and leaf plot shows groups of value frequencies within a data, within the, a set of data. This book will focus on stem and leaf plots of two digit numbers. In this case, the 10 digits are the stems and the ones digits are the leaves. So go ahead and underline that. The tens digits are the stems and the ones digits are the leaves. So basically think about if you have a stem, and then it has a leaf that comes off of it, right? The leaf is part of the stem, right? So I know that I have the leaf that, I know I have the stem that leads to the leaf. And so to make a stem and leaf plot of a set of two digit numbers, begin by writing the numbers in order from smallest to largest. So the first thing we've got to do is an order, uh-oh, Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, sorry. We were just, um, I think we, tell me, and I'm not sure when you dropped out. Let me look at, um, did you see when we talked about for homework 12-7 or today? Um, I, dropped, it's, I dropped out when you were like recapping frequency distribution. Okay, so we did the frequency distribution. And so um, for homework, we're not gonna have anything on frequency distribution just yet. We are going to have activities three on page 142 that'll be drawing a pictograph. 
Okay, so you'll draw a pictograph. And then we're jumping over a couple of lessons. I don't like the way that the book does the some of these things separated. I, I, and so we're, I'm going to pull out some lessons that we're going to do after Christmas that we're going to start off the um, new semester with. So we're going to jump over to lesson 67 that's on page 147. So page 147, stem and leaf. And this is kind of a different, I mean, it's a, um, oh, way too far. Um, a stem and leaf plot is something that is a little different. Where's my stem and leaf? Range. There we go. So a stem and leaf plot shows a group of value frequencies within a set of data. We said that the tens digits are the stems and the ones digits are the leaves. So to start, the first thing we have to do is begin by writing numbers in order from largest to smallest. So if this is our set of data they gave us, the first thing they did was to put it in order from smallest to largest. So they started with number 25 and it went up to the number 99, but just put them in order from smallest to largest. Then it says to make a two column chart with the stems zero through, zero through nine in the left column and the leaves, which are the ones digits and the corresponding right hand column. So step two is to make a two column chart. So we have stems on the left and leaves on the right. Remember we said our stems are representing our tens place with our number, okay? So if I look at the number 25, what number is in my tens place? Uh, two. A two is in the tens place. What number is in my fives place? I mean, in my fives place, <laughs> my ones place. Five. So my two is in my tens place. Five is in the ones place. So you can see down here, when I have a two as a stem or in my tens place, I put a five as a leaf in my ones place. So basically my stems are like the tens place and the leaves are my ones, okay? So when I do my stems, I go ahead and list my numbers zero through nine, but my first number was 25. So my stem is two, my leaf is one. Look at the number 28. My stem is two again, but now my leaf is an eight. So when I look at this and I see that I've got a stem of two and leaves of five and eight, that means I've got 25 and 28, okay? Notice that it jumped from 28 to 56. So that means I'm not gonna have anything in my three, four, or five place, okay? My three, four, and five stems, I'm sorry, not three, four, and five, just three and four stems. Now, when I get to my 50s, I can see I've got a 56 and a 57. So my stem is five, and I have a leaf of six and a leaf of seven. That represents 56 and 57. Now, let's look at our 60s, because this one, I've got 60, 61, 64, 64, and 66. So notice when I write those out, my stem is six, and I have a zero for 60, a one for 61, a four for 64. Notice I repeat the four digit because I have two number 64s and then a 66. Then I have 72, 84, then I have 92, 97, 98, 99. So my stem is representing the tens column and my leaves are representing my digits in my ones column. So if I were to look at this, okay, so now I'm gonna look at my stems and leaves. I'm gonna erase this so I can look at it. Which group of 10, is represented the most on this stem and leaf? Which group of 10 is represented the most? 
it's going to be my, my stem of six, right? Because I can see I've got one, two, three, four, five numbers that start with a six. So I can look at that chart really quick and see that my numbers, I have more numbers in the 60s than I do any other number. That's what a stem and leaf does. So when we look at the chart at the bottom of the table in your book in your LO, you can see that you have more numbers represented there, okay? So let's go ahead and do classwork one as an example, and then you'll have the other two for homework. All right, so what does it say the first thing we need to do is? We've got to put our numbers in order from least to greatest. What is my smallest number in this list? My smallest number, is there a number smaller than 26? What's after 26? I'll cross them off as we see them. Okay, so I've got 26. There's a 36, you said. Oh, what's in front of 34? 28. After 28 will be 33. And then we have 34. 36. 43. 45, 48, 50, 57, let's see, 65, we got 63, anything lower than the 63? Nope, 63. 65. 65. Then I have another 65, so I'm going to list it again. Um, 69. 69. And another 69. And then 70. 78. Oh, I forgot to mark that 69. 80. Another 80. And another 80, and then 94. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and count and make sure I got them all. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So my original list had 22, and I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Uh-oh, I missed something. Either that or I miscounted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's three sixty nines. Oh, three sixty nines. Is that what I missed? Thank you. I guess I marked one off without. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make room for him right over here. Sixty nine. So now you see the importance of going back and checking because you might have left one off. Okay. So now we put them in order from least to greatest. Now I need to make my two columns stem and leaves. Now remember my stems, I'm gonna go from zero to nine. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And now I look back at my numbers. Do I have any leaves for zero? Any leaves for the stem of zero? No. Any leaves for the stem of one? No. Any leaves for the stem of two? Do I have any numbers that start with a two? 20. 26 and 28. So what do I write as my leaves? A six and an eight, okay? So because I had 26 and 28, I put six and eight as my leaves. All right, so now I'm looking at my 30s. 
I have a stem of three, so I'm gonna have a leaf of three, four, and six. Three, four, and six. 43, I have a leaf, a stem of four, a leaf of three. 45, I have a stem of four, a leaf of five. 48, I have a stem of four and a leaf of eight. Mark off my 40s. 50s, I have a stem of zero and a stem of two. 60s, I have a, whoop, my 50s, I made them too close to my, whoop, cancel. Okay, so we had 50 and 52, or was it a seven? That's a 57, isn't it? So now in my 60s, I have 63, 65. I have another 65, so I write it down. And then 69 was the one that we had three of, so I have to put three nines. All right, 70, I have a zero. 78 is an eight. 80, I have two zeros, three zeros. And for 94, I have a four. So does everybody understand the first thing I do is put my numbers in order from least to greatest. Then I make my two column chart with stems and leaves. My stems I number from zero to nine. And then the leaves I fill in based on how many of each number I have in my list, okay? So for homework, you will have activities two on page. Hey, we, don't, we haven't covered median and mode. Yet. That's what I said, we were skipping over those. I'm saving those till after Christmas holidays. I want, because I'm, we're gonna spend a good bit of time on mean, median, mode, range, and um, I think that's it. Mean, it, says, median, mode. Make, it says make a stem leaf plot and find the median and mode of each set of numbers of the homework you're assigning for it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is in activities two, we are just gonna make a stem and leaf plot. So we're gonna mark out that find the median and mode. We're gonna mark that out and you're just going to make a stem and leaf for activities two, okay? So this is on page 148, activities two. So this is gonna be the end of our assignments and, and lessons today. So let's go ahead and look at our homework and make sure we've got a complete list. So we've got page 148, activities two. And we'll backtrack for a minute. Then we have page 142, activities three. And page 136, activity six. I think that is it. So page 136, activity six. Page 142, activities three. And page 148, activities two. Okay, so that's three different pages, but it shouldn't take you too terribly long. Um, so you can go ahead and get started on those right now if you want to. We've got about, what do we get out of here at 225? So we've got about 10 minutes left in class. So if you guys want to stay logged in, you're welcome to. If you want to log off and work on your assignments, that's up to you guys. The main thing is, is that this will be what we're looking at on Thursday. We will check these on Thursday. We'll finish talking about our different types of data representations. And then, like I said, when we get back after Christmas, we'll start with the mean, median, mode, and range. Okay. Be sure to let me know if you have questions, but right now, kind of the data representation is all kind of stuff that's just a lot of visual and learning how to pull it apart and put it into the chart um, and take the data and being able to understand what the data is telling you based on the type of design that it's showing you. Okay. Wow. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. We'll see you Thursday. You know.